Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> Did you bring like suntan lotion? Yeah. yeah? No? Uh oh. Do you think we should do it really early in the morning, like three? <laughs> okay. So, first of all, I pay my homage to all my Masters, all the way from the Shakyamuni Buddha to all my um, venerable masters. <clears throat> and um, then I also offer my um, homage. <clears throat> no? Okay. Um, Homage to all the bodhisattvas and the arhats and all sentient beings. Um, the word hina is a derogatory term. Um, It's a, it's a word. <clears throat> it's a word I think invented by Mahayana, and it's a it's a Mahayana, very Mahayana chauvinist word. It should never be allowed to exist. This word. Um, especially in this day and age. But I'm using this word for a specific reason. I actually made this up, Hina Mudra. There is no such thing as a Hina Mudra. There is Maha Mudra, yes. <clears throat> the reason I w invented this word is, um, it's a bit like this. Everybody wants to learn rocket science. They want to hear, they want to feel that they're in the classroom, elite classroom, where you hear the rocket science and, you know, it's technology and it's know-how. But actually, most of these people are not, e not even listening and not even hearing. But they just like to hear about it. Likewise, um, I think there's a lot of, you know, rush towards concepts such as Mahamudra or Mahasandhi. And more and more I realize that um, not only you are doing a disservice to the Mahamudra or Mahasandhi, you are actually doing a disservice to yourself because you are not ready for rocket science. And yet you are in this, because you want to be in that elite group, then you enroll yourself into that class. And then you end up not knowing anything about the, rock, the, the science of rocket. Sometimes even worse, you don't even know alphabets. And you, or you know only the K 
kindergarten level of rocket science and then assume that that's the rocket science final end period. And this seems to happen a lot more and more. I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding due to the lack of understanding of culture, due to the lack of understanding of language, etc. So this is why to just remind ourselves, we uh, come up with, th with this um, um, strange title, Hina Mudra. So I just want to put this in your head because I don't want you to realize, I don't, I don't want you to think that there is actually something called Hina Mudra somewhere in the Buddha Dharma. There isn't. But having said that, I want to talk really more about uh, ba basic foundation of Buddhism. And I think, I, I know there are some of you here who are quite seasoned both in study and practice of Buddha Dharma. But I think it is, and um, I think it's really important to always go, go back to the base, go back to the foundation, even, the, even for those who are already, those who have already gone through a lot of studies. So, for those who feel it's too basic and too, you know, sort of foundation level, then, you know, I, I have to tell you that um, this is not going to be that uh, useful for you. Now, first, I'm sure many of you know I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> now, this is a, an important statement. I want to say I'm a Buddhist. This is a really important statement. And the reason why I, I say it's an important statement is I've realized in the modern time, especially in the West, being a Buddhist, they try to, it's, it's almost like you have a, I don't know, some deformed in your body. You know, you feel like, you, you know, you are embarrassed for being a religious. And especially the intellectuals, um, I don't know, <coughs> academics, uh, so-called, I don't know, liberals think, you know, advanced thinkers, they seem to do this. Yeah, they can go, and go ahead and do whatever they want, but I want to tell you that I'm a Buddhist, and whatever is coming from my mouth is going to be hopefully related to Buddhism. And this is something that you need to know. Um, what, not only that, whatever coming from my mouth is also I have heard from my teachers, from the Buddha, till my teachers. Basically, I will be repeating, I will, be, I will do some commentary, I will express my understanding, my version. So if there is anything that is good, anything that is worthwhile, it is all credit to the Buddha, Bodhisattvas and all my masters. I don't want to claim here that this is my sort of revelation. And I need to tell you this because I've also, <clears throat> partly because as I'm getting old, I'm getting more grumpy, and I'm noticing there's a so many of that, both East and West, and probably more in the West, who steal ideas from Buddha, from Buddhism. They make a hodgepodge of everything, and then they claim that it is their sort of discovery and original, so on and so forth. And I'm, you know, you and I need to tell you, all, whatever I'm telling you, I'm sticking with the actual 
sutras, shastras, and also the pithi instructions from my gurus. So this is something that I want to tell you first. Now, to start with our Hina Mudra, I categorized into, uh, I created three categories this time. The first category is to become a sympathizer to Buddha Dharma. You are not yet a Buddhist. You are, you are sympathetic. You are admirer. You, you like Buddhism. Okay, so that's one category. You are not Buddhist. Because, you know, I don't know, for many reasons. Because you have, you have a family that you don't feel comfortable to be a Buddhist, or you are so-called this intellectual, scientific, very, you know, elite, who don't want to be labeled as any kind of religious group or whatever, because it's too, you know, outdated and too, you know, like, I don't know. Um, so, but you feel sympathetic towards Buddhism. So that's that category. The second category is Buddhist. We are going to talk about what is, what is being Buddhist. We will talk about being Buddhist. Being a sympathizer of Buddhism, being Buddhist. And then third, practitioner of the Buddha Dharma. So there are three categories are created, okay? And I think there's quite a big distinctions with these three, which hopefully I, will, I can explain and, you know, later on you can also ask questions. Now, what do we mean by sympathizer of Buddhism? Um, <clears throat> you have sympathy to, to Buddha, Bu Buddhism or the Buddha Dharma because probably you are impressed with what Buddha had to say. And I will give you I'll try to give you ten, there's so many, many reasons, maybe, why you are impressed with Buddha. I'm talking about a, a person, Shakyamuni, why you are so impressed with him. But I will, I, uh, I will cite ten reasons why you are impressed with the Buddha. The first one is Gelong Dagam Gelong Dagam Kenam Ji Sekje Dabri Sajin the Lekbar Tala Ngai Ka Lamara Chachir Kuchir Min I think this one, yes, many intellectuals will be quite impressed. He said, the follower, I, I will just uh, very, um, you know, I'm not going to go through, a, you know, thorough translation, just the gist. What he said is, those who have, those who are following Or we, um, those who okay, like a gold a goldsmith will analyze whether this <clears throat> material is a gold or not thoroughly analyze a gold, a wise goldsmith will not take anything that is shiny and yellowish as a gold. Likewise, my teachings need to be emphasized. Emphasized and um, uh, um, my teaching needs to be analyzed and um, how should I say? Use the logic, approach with the analytical method. Don't take it with on face value. Don't take it with blind devotion. So that's one. Um, we hear this now, today, uh, so much. Of course, most of the modern people are gro have grown up with this kind of value. But you need to remember, this was said 2,500 years ago. This was 
also said by a teacher, the Buddha. So I think this should be one good reason to be impressed with the Buddha. Okay. And then the second one. Like many teacher like many teachers or the I don't know, um saviors or religious founders, he said, Don't do bad things, don't do non virtuous things, do virtuous things. But the most important thing he said, Rangi Semni Yonsudul, tame your mind. And he's tame your mind. This is the essence of my teaching. I would say this is a quite a good reason to be impressed with him. Because, again, going back to 2,500 years ago, there are a lot of contemporary teachers who may have said, you know, don't steal, don't uh, kill, so on and so forth, and do good things. But coming right down to the basic foundation to tame your mind, on, I, I would say only the Buddha taught this. So this is the second reason why you should be impressed with the Buddha. <clears throat> and then the third, use yourself as an example and then do not harm. This, you know, what do we mean by harm? What, what do we mean by, what do you call it? non-virtuous action, negative action. How do, you, how, do you, how do you judge? How do you know something is non-virtuous? He said, use yourself as an example. If something that does not happen, if, if you don't want something that happens to you, then most probably the others also don't want to, what do you call it, uh, go through that kind of consequence. That's the third. Please keep track with the numbers. Dani dagi gönji, janta suji gönduju. Okay? The fourth is, you are your own master. Who else can be your master? Okay, getting more complicated now. <coughs> <clears throat> he said, you must know what is suffering. Important to make, highlight the word know. You must know suffering and you must therefore abandon the cause of suffering and then apply, oh yeah, and then know that cessation of the suffering is possible and there is a path that can apply so that one can seize the suffering for noble truth in other words the next if a cause and conditions are gathered. And if there is no obstacle, the result is guaranteed. That is undeceiving. Coming from a person 2,500 years ago, it's a good cause to be impressed with. Because, you know, if you look at the history, not many people, even way, way, Later than Shakyamuni Buddha, many people haven't taught like this. So basically, talking about the, the what do you call it, the reality of co cause, condition, and effect. And then next one, a Tathagata or the Buddha cannot wipe your suffering. He cannot also transfer, uh, transfer or share his realization. Only individually, by pursuing the path of the truth, one will realize. OK. 
Okay. The next one, the famous four seal. All compounded things are impermanent. All um, emotions are pain. All phenomena has no inherently existing truth or reality. And nirvana is beyond extreme. How many now? Hmm? Really? No, I don't think so. Okay. <clears throat> Now, this is the one that I re I'm so I'm, I'm this one this specific one is the one that really impressed me the most I would say. Migdan na wan ha yang cema min jedan lu dan yi jang cema min kal de wang bo di da cai ina pabi lam ji su la ji xi cha absolutely brilliant I think. What do you see with your eyes is not absolutely absolute truth is not you know absolutely valid likewise what you hear what you smell what you taste and what you feel and what you cognize all are absolutely not valid because they change they deteriorate they fade they transform what you think what you see you don't see it like that next day. So whatever you know, whatever you are experiencing using your five or six consciousness or senses, they are not absolute. This is a big statement. Again, remember, two thousand five hundred years ago this was spoken. The next one, the last one. And this is a very famous one. Sabji total was of Dumaji, Dujita, Bichoshi, Dagin, Sulat, and the Kormin, and Mirman Najit of Sanabacha. Supposedly, this is the statement after he achieved enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. This is what he has said. Or he, he expressed this. What he said was, I have found a truth that is profound, peaceful, extremeless, luminous, uncompounded, like a nectar. But no matter to whom I utter this, people will not hear. Therefore, I shall remain in the forest without speaking. Loosely translated. This is a really, really if you if you have if you can pay some attention to this this is a very very important statement that should really impress the intellectuals because what he's saying here actually it's a very it's a very tricky of saying something that cannot be said in even though he have said here that you know i have you know i can't teach because nobody is going to hear that's already a teaching here. In fact, this particular aspect of statement was later expounded more in places like Rajgir, like on the Vulture's Peak, like Prajanaparamita, where he taught Shunyata. Basically, the truth, the truth of the ph our life, phenomena, the reality, whatever, cannot be defined, conceptualized. It cannot be, you know, like uh, uh, verbalized. It cannot be symbolized. Because the moment you do, you do that, it becomes limited. So, these just ten different reasons why we, why some of us could get so impressed with the Buddha. And this is already good enough for many of you. You don't even have to become a Buddhist. If you are impressed with this, as a Buddhist, 
I, someone like me, the follower of the Buddha, will think that the seed of the Dharma is already planted in this person's heart. And since I'm a Buddhist, I believe in reincarnation. I believe in the relative truth of reincarnation. So I, I'm, I will believe that in the next life or towards the end of this person's life, he or she will become more and more inept or more matured to understand the Dharma more and more. So for someone like me, um, just to have this kind of, uh, what do you call it, impression is already good enough. You don't even have to be a Buddhist. Okay, so that's part one. We will, we'll, I will take some questions if you have now. Regarding this only, don't talk to me other things. <clears throat> one, two, one, two. Yeah. Okay. Say any. There's a cowboy and a palm seller <laughs> who can take you the mic. Any questions about this? There's there. Yeah. Just pass it, you know, just pass it like that, yeah, there. Raise your hand, please. Yeah. Okay, do you have it? Mike, you have it? Okay. Yes? Yeah. Yes, continue. Um, so, the question is this, so, um, as the Rinpoche you know, uh, um, Buddha taught a lot about abandoning concepts and conceptuality and today I was interested to hear you say that you're a Buddhist and um, people who use some of the Buddha's ideas that's maybe incorrect so I uh, maybe put it like that yeah so my question is um, in the world today there's so much fighting over religion, and these holding on tightly to, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim. So isn't there a danger that, I mean, Buddha was not a Buddhist. So isn't there a danger if one holds tightly onto the fact I'm a Buddhist and says that, that they will kind of trap, which is the conceptual trap of holding on tightly to an identity of a Buddhist? Yes, there is a danger, definitely. All path is a danger. Path is like a treacherous journey. But what I'm trying to say is, it is you might as well have one path that has a, some sort of a system that has been tested, has a, uh, some kind of a check and balance, a reference. Otherwise, if you keep on making up as you like, then they w I think it, it will become the biggest deception. And yes, all kinds of labels are dangerous. Being a Buddhist, and as you said, we are, you know, there's not even a single prayer in, uh, in Buddhism where we pray that we, we all become Buddhist we actually say we become Buddha. Yeah, on the ultimate and more on a profound level, you are very right. But I'm thinking about, like, it's a bit like, this is the example I was giving. If I'm teaching you how to make sushi, then I should give you a proper sort of, you know, like, ingredient and know-how, you understand? like. What is the procedure, the, the, you know, how to slice the fish and all of this, you know, you know, as it is taught in Japan, the original sort of sushi lineage. <laughs> I can always eat some su sushi and 
oh, cut my belly and take out some sushi from the one that I digested and give it to you. And you cannot really argue that that is not sushi because it is sushi. But by then it has become a little strange. And, <laughs> and then if you eat that, you will lose the, I don't know, it's a bit like this. I think it is really important. Um, and I use also the, you know, like music. For instance, the European, one of the most, you know, beautiful European culture is like, let's say, music, like the Beethoven. You know, you can add birds chirping, waterfall, thunder, with all this, you know, you. I think it's important also to preserve that, you know, the actual Beethoven, whatever. Otherwise, path is no more a path. Path becomes, you know, path needs some sort of a discipline. It needs to take you from one point to another point. And it's really dangerous to create this kind of, what do you call it, um, hodgepodge and, you know, like, um, mixed up everything. And um, I think when, you know, to me, the moment I say I'm a Buddhist, I'm obliged to abide by the book. Today, if I'm telling you here, teaching you, claiming I'm not a Buddhist, then I'm free. Then I can say whatever I say, and then don't forget, I'm a Gemini. I can sell <laughs> ice cube to Eskimos. <laughs> I can borrow from some Vedanta here, a little bit from Christianity, a little bit from here, there, make something so impressive. But then I'm entertaining. <laughs> and then if that's what you want, entertained, then that's another thing. But if you really want to follow, I think someone like me should have this. Um, I should be, and especially someone like me, myself, not an enlightened being, I should be, uh, what do you call it? I should feel stressed. Am I being according to the Buddhist teaching? Well, I think that's so important in this day and age. And also, I guess, um, um, because there's the atmosphere of becoming too, you know, like, wishy-washy, uh, the side of me, my, what do you call it, very conservative, traditionalist, right-wing, seems to be expressing this at the moment. <laughs> okay. And this has happened, by the way. It's not as if this hasn't happened in the past. This has happened a lot. Um, and this is why, actually, um, after Shakyamuni Buddha passed away, King Ashoka and so on, like Kanishka, they had to organize assemblies. You know the f famous three assembly of the Arhats? They had to do that because they didn't know what was taught by the Buddha and what was not. So I think this is on the relative world. Yeah, on the ultimate world, of course. You know, you are right. Any other? Related to this, please? Yes? Do you have the mic? So Rinpoche, um, I have a question. You said as long as you understand those four precepts, you could consider yourself a Buddhist. Um, you know, do you walk into a room with all these lamas and monks and, you know, somebody says, are you a Buddhist? And you don't know all the Vajrayana practices. You don't, right. you don't know all the mudras. You don't practice every day. We are, we are going to talk about Buddhist later. Okay. You are, you are to, you know, I've, so far I have been talking about just the sympathizer of Buddhism. The Buddhist, what do you call it? Buddhist sympathizer? Buddhist admirer. And I'm saying that this will suffice. You can just 
use, you can just, uh, you can just be that. Now, if you want to be a Buddhist, then we will talk about this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One more question, and then we actually go to that because we have quite a lot of things to catch up. There's one, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, please. Whoever has it. Whoever has the mic. Thank you, Rinpoche. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, one of the seals, which I find is very important to, to go into. And you very boldly translated as all emotions are pain. It's uh, sometimes more traditionally translated as uh, uh, all things are in the nature of suffering, yeah? And I think this kind of can create a little bit of confusion it can be taken as, okay, some things are suffering, some others not. Yes. yes so yeah, right. for us, very ordinary and very uh, small scope beings, um, even I had some discussions with friends where they were saying, no, no, this is not pain. This is just in the nature of pain. Yeah. Yeah. When I was writing that, yes, I did go back and forth for a long time, and then I opted the most dramatic one. <laughs> because I guess I have that habit to make, dramatize everything. And the reason why I'm doing this is this. I know New Age people, liberal people, they like to hear, oh no, love and compassion is not really suffering. It's an it's a emotion. Devotion is emotion, but that's not really suffering. I know that's what they want to hear. But the thing is this. The word suffering is not really doing the justice, actually. The Sanskrit word dukkha has the element of changing time. Anything that is subject to time means it's uncertain. And uncertainty is the, sort of, the ingredient of suffering. You know, like if you are making a coffee, water is a very important ingredient. But the coffee is the must. Likewise, Anything to do with the suffering, how to qualify the suffering, uncertainty. Anything to do with the beginning and, uh, and the middle. You know, you cannot trust. So, devotion, love, oh my God, love, <laughs> compassion, everything. Yes, so this is why I dramatize by saying all emotions are pain. So that's just a dramatic effect, that's it. <laughs> okay, we will take a break very soon, I think, is it? Half an hour more. So I've talked about, you know, how you don't have, you don't have to be a Buddhist. You can be admirer of the Buddha. And I've already given you 10 reasons. You can have so many, many more. You can read the word. You know, sutras such as wise and foolish. You can read such uh, sutras such as Prajnaparamita sutras. You can read Vinaya, Abhidharma. I mean, you can I mean, go on and on. And I was just talking recently to somebody that probably, I don't know, please, you, you do research. Vimalakirti Sutra probably is the first liturgy in the whole, whole world that mentions the gender equality in its highest form. Only now people seem to talk about, you know, the gender issues now in the, on this earth. But Buddha have taught this 2,500 years ago. So something, so there's so many points that we can be really impressed with uh, Buddha's teaching. Okay, so that's this, the, you know, the admirer of Buddha and the admirer of the Buddhism. You are not a Buddhist yet. Now, we talk about Buddhists. And I know being a Buddhist it immediately seems to have some sort of a preconception. What is, being, what is it 
what is meant by being Buddhist? Someone who doesn't play, no, who, who doesn't gamble? No, it's not. Someone who doesn't drink alcohol? No. Someone who doesn't eat meat? No. Someone who is peaceful and smiling? No. Someone who is non-violent? No. All this got, has got nothing to do with being Buddhist. As much as this is so simple, and I think many, many of you may think, oh, yeah, yeah, that's for, you know, that's, you know, given. That's, but you, you have to be careful. In our, you know, normal, mundane situation, many times people seem to have this preconception that Buddhists are someone who meditates or some sort of a, you know, like even outfit, he has to be a Buddhist because his head is shaved or he's wearing a maroon or he's, you know, he has a rosary, garland, you know, this malas, isn't it? No. So what is being, okay, so what is Buddhist? What is being Buddhist? Actually, quite simple. Remember we talked about all the reasons of why we can be so impressed and inspired by the Buddha? Now, on top of that, you then decide to actually take a vow. That's it. And what kind of vow I'm, we are talking about? We are actually talking about a very, very fundamental, simple vow, which is, okay, all compounded things are impermanent. Yes, that's for sure. We can't bend this rule. This is it. All compounded things are impermanent in beer, it's in New York is the same, Rome, Italy, wherever you go, all compounded things are the same. I mean, impermanent. All compounded things are impermanent 2,000 years ago. All compounded things are impermanent 2,000 years later. This is a fact that is not going to change. I am going to surrender to this. I will take a vow that I will trust this path. Now we are talking about being a Buddhist. So it's really a decision you are making. And some of you may think, oh, well, why make this decision? I mean, you know, can't, you know, again, you know, the lady's question earlier here, he, this is important. Why take this vow? A great Sarke Pandit, uh, Sarke Pandit has said, you can own a you know, plot of land, a farmer, yeah, you are very rich because you have this plot. But if you don't cultivate, if you don't plant rice or barley or whatever, then it's just a plot of land. But if you cultivate, then they, there will be rice, there will be marigold, there will be food coming. So it's like this, it, vow, what vow does is it aligns you, it, it's a, it gives you a focus because you want to have that kind of focus. You realize that, okay, what's the benefit of, for me by taking, accepting this view that all compounded things are impermanent? What's the benefit? Oh, there's a lot of benefit. You realize most of my suffering comes from thinking or forgetting that all compounded things are impermanent. We keep on thinking things are permanent. Things will last forever. Relationship, shopping, whatever, house design. It doesn't matter, scheduling. We, you know, like, I just finished scheduling uh, with some people uh, with a lot of stress. Um, that what I'm, you know, I will be somewhere 2019. 
like this. We intellectually forget things are impermanent. We emotionally forget. We habitually forget. We habitually, we practically forget. And by forgetting this, we have the we have the delusion that things will work out. Things will be, things will come as you expect. And then when it doesn't happen, disappointment, and that leads to the suffering. So knowing that there is something in it, you then take a vow, which in the classic Buddhist text we use the word refuge, because it sounds dramatic again. <laughs> that's, that's all there is, actually. It's taking a decision. You can dramatize this much more by actually having a ceremony of so-called taking refuge, you know, like doing prostrations and all of this. But basically, it is, I really am going to buy this truth. I buy this. I, I resonate with this truth. I resonate with this path. Therefore, I'm going to, I am going to apply a certain discipline. So, in the classic Buddhist teachings, we say, that taking refuge to the Dharma, and therefore the one who expounds this teaching, the Buddha, and then the community that also shares the same path, the Sangha, taking refuge, surrendering, accepting, this is what makes you a Buddhist, basically. I'm going to uh, what do you call it, um, <clears throat> talk about this a little bit. Since, remember, this time um, emphasizes on the most foundational level, very important for lazy, um, busy, but who still admires Buddha's teaching, but who don't want to just become the admirer of the Buddha's teaching, who sort of wants to be a Buddhist, but also who don't want to really give up whiskey, <laughs> give up, you know, all kinds of things. And you, you know, I, most of you, I don't believe that you will meditate from today onwards. <laughs> if you do, probably once in a while when you are in the mood. Most of you, like myself, I should say, you know, we are very lazy and we are not disciplined. But we like Shakyamuni Buddha. We like what he has to say. It's really nice. Even to read a little bit sometimes, it's very, you know, soothing, and that's good. That's already good. And, and the, all, now we are adding something extra, which is basically telling oneself, I am going to follow this path. So I made some list here, which... Okay. Really, really on the foundation level, okay? You want to become Buddhist. Now that I'm, I'm, I have become a Buddhist, what should I do? Admire, like, you know, I'm using the you know, Instagram words, <laughs> you know, like this kind of like, 
like um, what else is there some emotion you know like um you are not meditating you are not chanting nothing you are not reading sutras nothing no just admiring so admire maybe how about like once a month for like about a minute Twelve times, twelve minutes a year. I'm serious. This will do. One minute a month. You can't be that busy. <laughs> Telling us, oh, you know, Chakramuni Buddha is very special. His teachings are really special. I am really. I really liked his teachings. Just that. You understand? Okay. Can you do that now? Today is what? March 25th. <laughs> March 25th. The next you will do April 25th. Can you, can you make a note of this also? Just said, okay. no need to sit straight. Not, no need to sit straight. You can be whatever. Please. Okay, for one minute. Just admiring his teachings. And thinking, I'm, I'm going to abide with this. But can you please actually not sit straight? I, it, it bothers me <laughs> a little bit. It makes me feel a little bit. You are meditating or you are becoming. Can you not do it? Yeah, do whatever. You know, scratch your, scratch your, I don't know, whatever, you know, and then. <laughs> Just that. Thirty seconds more. <laughs> oh gosh, you guys keep on meditating. I don't understand. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's it. I'm serious and I'm now going to back up with this. You know, I didn't make this up. Really. You 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 may be thinking I'm like you know, this is a new age, modern teaching. Absolutely not. There are so many, many Buddha's quotations. For instance, the moment you even have a meba, how do you say meba? Where's Jurme? Is Jurme here? What is Mepa? Admiration? Aspiration? Aspiration? Yeah. Kanji Mepa Yije Pa Dei Duna To whom you have, you know, the, the person who have this instant, momentary, flickering moment of admiration to the Buddha and his teachings. In front of this person, he said, there's Buddha. And this is good enough, really. No need more. No need to sit too many hours. No need to do Monro. No need to do three years retreat. No need to become monk or nun. No need to go to Bodhgaya. No need to go to Bodhgaya. No need to buy a statue of the Buddha. Nothing. No need to look like a Buddha. Really, no need to look like a Buddha, dress like a Buddha. There isn't actually. Um, do you think you can do this? this is so, and really, it, it's supposedly, this is the foundation, this is the seed. I'm telling you, many, many Mahamudra and Mahasandhi practitioners don't have this. They're all looking for Mahasandhi teachings, but they have no admiration to the Buddha. How terrible is this? It's like a tree standing there, but no, no root. Any moment, a small wind <laughs> tree will fall. You have to have this.
And I'm giving you something quite doable. One, mo one minute a month. But I have a vague feeling you will not do it. <laughs> I have a vague feeling you will not be, you know, even this is too much for you, isn't it? <laughs> I have a vague feeling. <laughs> I don't know, something tells me you won't do it. <laughs> Any questions regarding this before the next one? Yeah, please. Okay. Rinpoche, so I think I'm very hardwired with my, you know, the way I am. And I don't think I have even, I have zero connection to the Buddha. Zero. So for me, it's like, uh, you know, even when I walk in and I see the statue, for me, it's very hard to even prostrate or do anything, you know, because it doesn't come naturally. Okay. But for me, those teachings are coming from you. And my other gurus out there who gave me some amazing teachings. So for me, it's, I feel that if I think of you, I think of these gurus, it's for me a lot better than to think of the Buddha Shakyamuni. Yeah. Actually, the teaching. Oh, you reminded me, you reminded me another impressive thing that Buddha said. He said, never rely on the person, but to the teaching. So it is that if you are impressed with the teaching, if you are convinced with the teaching, that's it. That's the fundamental, of course. Anything? Any, anybody? Yeah? Rinpoche, I think I have a connected question. It came up in response to the previous one. And I was just thinking that, is it really important to even have a teacher? And can there just be self-realization? And would we still call it cheating or borrowing of ideas or that you have to have a teacher to be, become okay. enlightened? Very good. Here I need to call it, uh, define, uh, you know, I need to explain this a little bit. I don't know, if, he, if you have been uh, sort of mingling with Tibetan Buddhists, they may be shoving some teachers down your throat. <laughs> Stand. I need to tell you this. The teacher in the Tantra is a totally different phenomena, which we will talk maybe if we have time, maybe day after tomorrow or something, okay? That concept of teacher is actually much more than a person. It's basically a whole other phenomena. Okay? Now, that kind of teacher you don't need. As I have just said, you do not depend on the person. You d r depend on the, what do you call it, you rely on the teaching. Having said this, um, even in the most foundation level, um, in the sutras, also in the shastras, it's highly recommended to have a teacher just because your own interpretation and your own mind is so tricky. You understand? So, just to annoy you, just to sort of contradict you, if not guide, protect, teach, you understand? Just to annoy your thinking, just to pull a rug out of your feet constantly, it's advisable. And of course, if you have a compassionate, qualified teacher, priceless. Because it's just, you know, having, you know, like 
the Buddhist saying is this, Buddhist teaching is this, never rely on the person, but rely on the teaching. Uh, teaching. But myself, I'm, I don't have that, this kind of a wit to understand the teaching and therefore rely on the, what is it, the teaching. I'm more emotional person, so I grew up with this amazing teacher and I got so inspired by them and therefore, so it came, to me it came from that, that. But what helped me is by understanding the teaching, it made me respect more all the teachers that I have also admired. Um, Rinpoche, uh, both with this point about cherry picking from different paths and faiths, as well as the notion of not having a teacher, um, I think maybe it stems from the same um, issue, which is that we, we don't realize how much maybe our mind can delude us even with spiritual material, with spiritual content. Mm -hmm. Are there any tricks we can use or any tests we can do on our own mind to appreciate or sensitize ourselves with how quickly we get deluded, even with spiritual content and spiritual knowledge? Uh, without the teacher you are talking about, right? Yes, Rinpoche. Without the teacher. It's, it's much more difficult, but... The general advice is you do a lot of hearing and contemplation. Because hearing and contemplation, by reading lots of books, receiving lots of teachings, will always question your previous understanding and the realization. And that, I think, is the pillar. Okay. We, we will carry on now being Buddhist. We will, there's a, okay, so most fundamental, fundamental level we talked. Now, you want to do a little bit more than a minute a month. You understand? You think, and by the way, I'm not even talking about practitioner. Remember? Admirer of Buddhism. Buddhist and practitioner. I'm categorizing this. I'm still talking about being Buddhist. Okay, so as I briefly mentioned earlier, you will have to now, if you want to do a little bit more than what we have been discussing, you should now consider taking refuge. Taking refuge to Dharma, Buddha and the Sangha. It basically means surrendering to the truth and therefore one who expounds the truth and the community that lies with this truth. Um, most of us, we don't have time to go through extensive hearing. You don't have time, you don't have the appetite, you know, you are busy. So hearing the Dharma, so that you get inspired, the chances to, to hear the Dharma and to get inspired is very slim. But here and there, if you pick up some wisdom such as, you know, all compounded things are impermanent, and then if that gives you a conviction, and by the way, before that I should have told you this, you know, in all this, there's a something, and this also uh, is true to what I have said earlier, the, the first category, admirer of Buddhism. In all this, there's one thing that will determine, determine your, I don't know, 
your path, which is merit. That is another different level. You understand? That's, I don't know. You know, earlier I was talking about, you know, inspired, impressed with the Buddha. Everything what I said this morning, the reason why we should be impressed with the Buddha, if you don't have the merit, not only they will not impress you, they will just annoy you. And you will not understand. Even things like my teachings, you must analyze. You can't take it for face value. For, in, for someone who, uh, uh, let's say, intellect, I don't know, for some of us, maybe it is very impressive and very, very convincing and very inspiring. But for a lot of people, it may not. It may, they, can in, they can interpret this as, oh, Buddha must be someone who is such a weakling. He can't even, you know, he can't even expound with the confidence that you guys should all listen to me, because I'm the one who is enlightened. So, entirely, really depends on what we Buddhists call merit. You understand? Merit is... It's a very important. It will play a very important role in your life. Um, l l merit or lack of merit. And yes, you may be the most intellectual. You may be the most logical, most scientific. Doesn't mean much. When the merit or lack of merit hits you, your decision will be determined by this merit. Okay, I need to say this. Now, going, coming back to the refuge. Refuge is basically surrendering, or actually, surrender maybe is not the right word, accepting the truth wholeheartedly. Such as the Four Noble Truth, Four Seed, whatever we have been discussing earlier. And then coming down to some sort of a conclusion that you will follow this path. So this so-called act of taking refuge is important if you want to be a Buddhist. Now, again, we are talking about, we are talking on the level of ordinary, lazy, busy, people like myself, you take refuge. You say, okay, I really trust this path, path of such as Four Noble Truth, Four Seal. And therefore, I also respect and accept the teacher of this, who have realized this, the Buddha. And I, have, I will also accept and um, accept and uh, what do you call this? Yeah, accept and take refuge to the Sangha, which is the community that takes this path as their path. You can take this refuge once in your life and never ever go to the temple. Never even recite refuge prayers once after this. You are still a Buddhist. I, you need to know this. You understand? Until one day you think, oh, no, some things are permanent. <laughs> my, I don't know, my relationship with my lover, that's permanent. That's truly existing. No, no, I'm being a bit too mean here. But. <laughs> intellectually, practically, and emotionally actually having a doubt to the truth. No, not everything is imp uh, but emptiness. Some things truly exist. Until then, you are a Buddhist. I need to rephrase this, okay? You take refuge, not from a person, 
I'm, I'm not even talking about from a person. You do it alone somewhere because you are too shy in front of your friends and family to call yourself Buddhist. So, you know, close the door, close your bedroom door if you want. If you, uh, I mean, if you don't want, you can just standing up and walk around in the room and think, yeah, for noble truth, I accept, I buy this, you know. I resonate with this. For seal, I really like it. And I am going to abide with this truth. And the teacher of this truth and the community, you are Buddhist. You have to know this. I, you know, many, many so-called Mahamudra and Mahasandhi practitioners don't seem to know this. These fundamental things. You are a Buddhist. You understand? You're playing mahjong. Every day you go to casino, you are still a Buddhist. Every day you eat meat, drink alcohol, you are still a Buddhist. You understand? Not necessarily a good Buddhist. <laughs> you understand? You are still a Buddhist. It's really important you know. You, uh, not, not one inch of Buddha statue in your room, no prostration, nothing. Like this guy said, you don't even prostrate, you, nothing. But you accept this in your heart. You are a Buddhist. And when do you finish this being Buddhist? As I said, when one day, when you think, no, certain things are permanent. You understand? Like when you, when, you, when you go against something like a four seed or four noble truth, or then, of course, obviously, you are, you are in a different uh, path. Then you are no more a Buddhist. You have stopped taking that path as the, your, your path. These are something that I've been really wanting to express, and it has been sort of building up in my chest. So I'm kind of happy that I've managed to do this. I know there are so many, you know, here, so many, um, you know, seasoned Buddhist practitioners. You know, you, you deserve much more, you know, constructive teachings. But I urge you that this is, uh, this is quite a fundamental, and this is something that you really need to know. Okay, are we taking a break here? 45 minutes break, right? Hello, okay. So I'm going to contradict SP a little bit, not contradict, change a little bit. I think the sun is so hot, so this morning I'm doing something very short, but if you can come back around 4 in the afternoon. Uh, okay. And then I will continue for about an hour, and then we can go on, go ahead with the other. Thing. But um, there are just a few more things to add, what I've been saying this morning. <clears throat> mm. Beside what I have said, that this basic fundamental information is so important that you know especially by seasoned, so-called seasoned Buddhist practitioners, Mahamudra practitioners, Mahayana practitioners, Mahasandhi practitioners. This, uh, there's something else. Because I think, somehow, as, that, um, as after Buddha taught, obviously, the teaching has to go through the, you know, um, sort of tube of different tradition, culture, society, and lifestyle, professions. So I think it gets lost. For instance, I feel, you know, I only know about Tibetan um, uh, habit. So I'm going to speak Tibetan habit. Um, as 
example. I feel that this is what seems to be happening. Like, the moment you go to a Tibetan Buddhist uh, class or a teacher or a teaching, you are almost made to believe that to be a Buddhist, you have to take refuge. Yes, of course. That, I mean, that's... that's um, that is not um, incorrect. That, but the way it is explained, the concept of the refuge, is almost always narrowed down to some sort of a ceremony, like a cutting the hair and giving the name, which is, you know, which is part of the paraphilia. But the fundamental thing is that, you know, that ceremony is not that important. It does help you. It's like a New Year's, what? Resolution. I mean, you can do a daily resolution if you want, but it somehow makes you feel better to do it on a New Year day because, you know, that's how we human beings are, conditioned. So it does help us to do all that ceremony. And I'm not stopping you to do that. But fundamental thing is by accepting that path as something trustable, something that you can rely on. And once you do that, once you do that, actually, to be really uh, true to the teaching, you can even take this kind of refuge vow, just thinking that Buddha is in front of you and you are, you are taking refuge from this person this being. And I've told you again and again, the idea, you know, the once you accept that truth, until you actually oppose this truth, you are following that path. You know, while you are sleeping, you are Buddhist. You are not, you don't have to always think, okay, all compounded things are impermanent. Okay, this is convincing, this is truth. I am going to surrender to that. As an example, when you are sleeping, you forget that. Of course, you are a human being. You know, do you remember? You don't have to always remember your name. When you are thinking, when you are sleeping, you don't think about your name until you uh, the name is necessary. You understand? So you can forget it when you are in. When you are distracted, you may be not thinking about it, but when you, if you consciously decide to go against and oppo oppose that truth, then you are norm you have, you can use the the term you have broken the vow. Okay, you have you have broken the vow. There is no punishment of such as, you know, like you will now go to hell or something like this. Basically, you will now, from the Buddhist point of view, I would say, you will now go further from the non-truth. Because things are impermanent. All compounded things are impermanent. And you are now going away from that. And you are bound to be doomed. Because sooner or later, one of these is going to disappoint you. Um, yeah, another thing the Tibetan in the Tibetan teaching situation, to be a Buddhist you almost have to do things like four foundations or change your outlook. I just want to tell you that this is not a must. You don't have to. I think um, I managed to, I hope I have managed to clarify this. And then one more thing I want to express is about the merit. Now, I know I have been talking about how we are so impressed that Buddha said, you have to analyze. And this is a very important. In Buddhism, you analyze the path. You have to use logic. You have to use your rational mind and all of this. In the midst of this, though, 
I don't want you to forget something called merit. So I don't want to also look down on something called blind devotion that sometimes we sort of look down. I have to tell you honestly with me, with me, many, many, I would say more connection to connection with me from those who are not people coming from traditionally not Buddhist. I don't know, maybe 50-50. The 50% may have come with, you know, a little bit of, you know, conviction with the logic and analysis and Buddhism being very rational, so on and so forth. I mean, I have come, I, I know a student who came to my teachings and when I asked him, why did you, why you, are, why you like to enter into Buddhist path? He said, because Buddhists don't have the answer to this question, what is the purpose of life? And he said, he detests all these religions who always ask this question, what's the purpose of life? And they always have an answer. But Buddhists don't seem to have. And this is what he likes. It's a very profound to me, actually. To come to think of it. Because concepts such as purpose of life is very, very Abrahamic, sort of very dualistic. When you believe in some sort of a truly existing soul or a person, then you have to also have a purpose. I thought the guy did a good job in contemplating. But I also have, and quite a lot of it, I have so many people, and this is a so mind-boggling. So many people come to me by saying, oh, you know, I really want to follow your tradition because I like Guru Rinpoche. Now, this is so surprising for me. Because if you, someone who is totally new to Buddha Dharma, if you compare the image of Shakyamuni Buddha and the Guru Rinpoche, Shakyamuni Buddha is much more serene. It looks like the, you know, the, your usual Savior, you know, serene, bare feet, begging ball, you know, the kind of the more pure, pure looking. But even from people, countries like Croatia, Slovakia, there are people who get inspired to the teachings of the Tantra because of the image of a Buddha. I mean, the image of Guru Rinpoche. This happens a lot. I also have somebody from Australia. It's quite interesting. This person... For 10 years, he goes to a bookshop every day just to browse. And um, one time he took a book and he found uh, Chen Chokhi Lord's photograph. And he immediately closed it. So he, you know, it must be something Himalaya, whatever. So he put it back. But then somehow he kept on having this dream and vision of this person. So he had to go back to this bookshop, but he had to delay it because of all sorts of other things happening in his life. But anyway, one time he managed to go back to the same bookshop. The book is still there. He took it out and then read about Jami Shanti Chokulore for a long time. And he also met me five, six years later. Only after that he realized I'm supposedly incarnation of Shanti Chokulore. This kind of thing happens. So merit and a connection to the teaching plays a very, very important role. And it's not something that we have to sort of, we should uh, look down. It, it happens. And um, this gets created by, uh, you know, teachings being taught, images of the Buddha being built. Uh, key teaching gatherings like this thing being organized, something like this could also plant the seed of, uh, you know, this liking towards this truth. Like uh, Vasubandhu's story, Vasubandhu reads Prajanaparamita, I think so. Um, the short what is it, um, sutra written by Nagarjuna. 
And as he was reading this, a pigeon next to him keeps on hearing this. And in the next life, the pigeon become uh, one of the four most important, four most important disciple of Vasubandhu. So, merit or karma always plays a very important role. So that's it. Please come back around four.